Good afternoon and welcome to the third of our 56 Chicago International Film Festival's Critics Picks, where we invite local and national film critics to uh, share with us their uh, top picks for the festival this year. My name is Alejandro Herrera, festival publicist, as well as movie reviewer for gozamos.com and filmcritic.com. And it's my pleasure to welcome to this third Critics Picks, Adam Kempenar and Josh Larson, the dynamic duo behind one of the most influential, if not the most influential film podcast in the country, Film Spotting. Welcome aboard, guys. How are you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having us. Yeah, this is a real honor to be part of the Hometown Festival. Thanks. No problem. So let's talk about picks. Let's talk about those five titles that have moved you, that are, have excited you, that have sort of rocked your world. You know, let's start with you, Adam. What will be your number five, fifth pick? Well, haven't had a chance to watch it yet, but really excited about Undine, a mm -hmm. movie from Germany, Christian Petzl, the filmmaker and you know, it's a. My understanding is that it's about a a woman who bears that that name of that mythological water nymph, and she's just gone through a breakup, and it's all about kind of what her her fate is going to be. But it's really the the story is kind of secondary to me to it just being a film by Christian Petzl and being interested in whatever he's doing next after 2015's Phoenix and one of my favorite films of 2019, Transit, and he's actually reteamed the the pair from. Transit, Paula Beer and Franz Rogowski, two just really uh, wonderfully talented performers. Uh, they're both in Undine. So that's uh, that's my number five uh, must see at the festival. How about you, Josh? Yeah, right away, uh, I was drawn to Apples and I'm reading the description for Apples in the festival at the festival website um, about this, uh, a pandemic raging across the globe. We can relate to that, right? <laughs> Um, <laughs> causing sudden amnesia, which is an interesting concept. And the main character here uh, is afflicted and goes into this rehabilitation program that basically um, performs these tasks that will mimic life's moments. And then he has to capture these with a Polaroid camera. And I'm thinking as I'm reading this, boy, does this sound like something Greek director Yorgos Lanthimos would make. Uh, who He did Love Lobster, which I love. He did Dogtooth. Um, which is a favorite of film spotting. And sure enough, it turns out that the director of Apple's, Christos Nico, was an assistant director and script supervisor on Dogtooth. So you can see the influence there, maybe in this high concept, um, possibly very discomforting story, which is something Lanthimos specializes in too. So uh, these movies I've been drawn to for some reason, even though you come out um, feeling a little uncomfortable, Maybe Apples will deliver a little bit of that as well. I have not had a chance to see it yet, but it's definitely one that has jumped out to me. Are you as big a fan of Christian Petzl as Adam is? I think Adam's probably a little bit bigger of a fan, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I did like Transit as well and am definitely looking forward to the Petzl film too. What's number four for you guys? So I've got a documentary that I actually have had a chance to see, and that's Kubrick by Kubrick by Gregory Monroe. I mean, I guess it's probably a pretty obvious pick for a film critic to want to watch a movie about Stanley Kubrick. But And I've joked on the show that I think there's just as many, if not more, documentaries now about Stanley Kubrick and his work as there are films that Stanley Kubrick actually made, which speaks, I think, to you know the power of him as a filmmaker and kind of the enduring legacy of his work. And this one has a really interesting hook, which is there's audio that my understanding is has never before been heard uh, that was compiled into a 1982 book by a French critic and author um, based on interviews with Kubrick. But this is the the audio recordings of those conversations that, that go through all of his films up to that point, even actually look ahead uh, to Eyes Wide Shut uh, because it was a movie he talked about for a long time that he wanted to make. So they were kind of talking about the source material and the possibility of perhaps adapting it. But I really like that we, I mean, it's something we don't get to do much, right? Actually hear from Stanley Kubrick, just just hear from him at all, much less hear him really talk about his work in, in great detail. And while it does cover some of the same ground as some of the other films that have looked at his work and, you know, they, they get into some of the, you know, um, the infamous stories of how he, you know, how exacting he is, uh, including on performers when he's making a film, all the takes he does. It's really more about the commonalities in his work and some of the same thematic concerns that run throughout his film. So I think it's it's an entertaining film. It's an educating, uh, educational film and also kind of a, a, a good piece of film criticism in its own right. 
Would you consider it sort of a nice entry point for people who have yet to become familiar with Kubrick's work? Actually, I think it probably would uh, if you've only seen maybe one or two of his films and, and haven't really taken that plunge. I think it would give you a really good foundation, um, especially since his films are so different, right? Like mm -hmm. he, he's worked in so many different types of genres. Uh, it, it might not be apparent at first glance kind of what some of those those common themes are, and those connections, but they're definitely there. I think that actually would probably make a lot of sense. Let's go back to you, Josh, your, your number four pick. Unfortunately, I was just checking the festival website today and my number four pick is sold out. So um, <laughs> virtual cinemas, you can still sell out. The movie though, I do want to put on people's radar. It's I'm Your Woman. The mm. director here is Julia Hart. And I did like a previous film of hers that I was able to see, Fast Color. Maybe some other people are familiar with that one. But this new film, I'm Your Woman, stars Rachel Brosnahan who is the center of the Amazon series, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, which I am a fan of. So really excited to see Brosnahan on the big screen. Here she plays a suburban 1970s housewife who has to go on the run when her husband, a thief, betrays his partners. So I'm excited about this as a combination of these two talents, kind of rising talents, getting together and you know possibly taking a big step forward with uh, this latest film, I'm Your Woman. What's next on your list, Josh? The next one I am is probably my favorite of the bunch and no surprise because it's from a Chicago filmmaker, Steve James with Cartemquin mm -hmm. Films. It's a documentary series actually, City So Real. And if I have this right, I think all five episodes are now available yep. um, through the festival to stream, which is great because you're just going to want to gobble these down. I, I'm on the, I just finished the third episode today. And um, it traces the last mayoral campaign with the Laquan McDonald killing in the backdrop. So a really crucial period in the city's history that we're still kind of living through. Mm -hmm. um, and it is absolutely gripping in how it both gets into the nitty gritty of things like objections to petition signatures to get on the mayoral ballot. Like that's intensely suspenseful, how James... Um, captures that nitty gritty detail of democracy, but also it, it jumps all over the city from neighborhood to neighborhood. I'm kind of a map geek and I love the recurring visual motif where they'll show the Chicago map of neighborhoods and just highlight, you know, the little pocket that we're going to go spend five minutes in, where it is in the city. Um, and that just kind of marks how it's such an extremely segregated city still um, and just puts us right in the middle of these different neighborhoods and what it's like to be there. So this is a fascinating document uh, that, again, is a five-part series, um, but you'll you'll whisk right through it, especially if you have any sort of connection with Chicago. And you know, the interesting thing is that uh, Steve showed the first four parts at Sundance because he was still working on episode five. And my understanding is that he was literally working episode five almost close to our opening night. So like mm -hmm. literally, this is... This game's fresh from the lab, but then you're looking at what's been happening for the last 48 hours. So you're kind of like, you could have waited for part six, you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's why it's it's completely relevant to exactly the moment we're at right now. So it's really exciting work. Adam, what's next on your list? Well, going to stick with the documentary, though, uh, going way outside of Chicago, across the entire globe with the uh, new one from Werner Herzog. It's called Fireball, yeah. Visitors from Darker Worlds. This is another collaboration with Clive Oppenheimer, who has the title I Strive For Someday, Volcanologist. I think I'm, I'm just a few, few credits shy. They worked together on a film from 2016 called Into the Inferno, which I actually haven't had a chance to see. Curious, really, to see it as I am with any Werner Herzog film, but especially now having had a chance to see Fireball, which really does go all across the globe and look at where major uh, meteorites uh, have have crashed down, the impact, you know, literally and and sort of metaphorically they've had on our world, uh, down to the the tiniest fragments of of meteoroids, and it's it's really fascinating. I think what what really makes it special, having now seen it is you realize that Werner Herzog is one of those filmmakers who is just as fascinated by, if not more fascinated by, people. And the people mm -hmm. who are talking about these subjects as he is the subjects himself, you know? And he's he's behind the camera for most of this, except for his voiceover, which is, you know, very prominent. And one of the reasons why I think you wanna watch any Werner Herzog documentary is to hear that great Bavarian accent and, and just his his worldview come through in his his tone and his, his cadence. But you don't see him much, but at some point you really do feel like you're 
you're studying the people speaking and you're taking in kind of their passion and knowledge for these subjects the same way he is. It's as if you're, you really are looking at them through the lens, through the eyes of, of Werner Herzog, which I think is, is pretty special. Now that you mention it, I think that sort of ties it in with his previous documentary, which was also released this year, Nomad. I mean, there's that interest on, in this case, Bruce Chadwin and the, the way Bruce saw the world and how Bernard sees the world through Bruce. I mean, it seems to me that there's a, a clear connection, a clear, clear global connection between the two films. Yeah, for, and Encounters the End of the World is another great nature film, if you will, by Herzog. Of course, Cave of Forgotten Dreams, uh, Grizzly Man 2 uh, from the late 2000s, just fantastic stuff. So highly recommend uh, uh, all things Werner Herzog. All right, we got about four minutes. Let's go with your final two titles, Adam. Well, I've got it number two, One Night in Miami, which is mm -hmm. the directing debut of Regina King. And this is, you know, we'll mix narrative here with uh, with nonfiction as it's it's based on a real event, which is the night that uh, Cassius Clay, soon to become Muhammad Ali, defeats Sonny Liston to become heavyweight champ of the world. And and he, he's actually there. You know, we get to sort of experience what it was like to be in that room with Muhammad Ali, Malcolm X, Jim Brown, uh, and Sam Cooke. And, you know, I want to be in that room. <laughs> I, I don't know how, how fabricated or apocryphal it all is, but I want to be there in that room. And I love that, you know, Leslie Odom Jr. from Hamilton is playing Sam Cooke uh, and also Kingsley ben playing Malcolm X, someone I saw recently uh, on the High Fidelity TV series and I thought was really good. So that's number two for me. Number one? Number one, I know Josh and I shared this one, so jumping ahead a little bit, but it's got to be the <laughs> film that I'm pretty sure is closing closing out the festival uh, and based on all of its acclaim, deservedly so, it's Nomad Land from Chloe Zhao. Uh, if, if there's one film we got to see, it's that one. We haven't had the pleasure yet, but that's the one we want to see, really just based on Zhao's previous work. Her last film, The Writer, was one of our favorite films of that year. So anything anything she does, can't wait to see. Josh, he gave away the your number one. What's your number two then? Yeah, definitely excited about Nomad Land, which I think also is sold out. And my other pick at number two is sold out as well. So I don't know, either I'm not that original or I picked the exact right ones. Uh, <laughs> but at number two, I had Bad Hair, which comes from oh, writer director Justin Simeon. Uh, he made Dear White People previously, the feature film, which also became a series. And so I'm really excited to see what he's going to do with Bad Hair. It's delving into horror. So mm -hmm. taking kind of a genre shift, for him, which is really exciting whenever, especially young filmmakers, try something a little bit new. Um, that was my final pick. You can get us in though, right? Alejandro, tickets. You can get us into some of these screenings that are sold out. <laughs> well, pull we'll, the we'll, ring. We'll, we'll ask, I can always ask, you never know. I thought that was the you deal, that's why we're doing that. You need a car though. <laughs> <laughs> True. So uh, let me ask you about Chloe Zhao, uh, Josh. What, what, is, what makes her such a special filmmaker? So I actually got to see her first film at Sundance in 2015, Songs My Brothers Taught Me. And mm -hmm. she just has um, an eye for both amazing, fan not fantastical, that's probably st too strong of a word, but sort of transcendent imagery that's rooted in reality. And the writer in particular was this interesting blend of a real story and often using people who's that was part of their lives, but they somewhat reenacted it for the writer um, in a dramatic version. And so she's kind of dancing across those lines in her filmmaking um, of using real life, but giving it again, this sort of transcendent lens. And so now you imagine, how does that work with um, someone like Frances McDormand at the center of your film, right? In Nomad Land, who is one of our greatest actors, I think. And I'm just so excited to see how all of those elements come into play together. Well, it's, especially when it looks like uh, Chloe is combining fiction and documentary, she's having Frances McDormand meet all these real life people. See that sort of exchange, see that sort of like, like, like dialogue take place. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Perfect. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining us on this Critics Picks. Ladies and gentlemen, Adam Campenart, Josh Larson from Film Spotting. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. And, and join me on Saturday We're gonna when we're going to have Cat Sachs and Ben Sachs from Cinephile join us in another Critics Picks. Thank you all for joining us and enjoy the rest of the festival.